Welcome to the Fish North Georgia podcast, where we talk everything fishing here in North Georgia. Make a cast over that brush pot and bring wolf packs of spotted bass up. Georgia is blessed with so many of these electric only lakes. No, I didn't say that, Danny. Don't, okay, don't so, speculate right, now. So the, hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Fish North Georgia mini cast. I am here with our resident fisheries biologist, Shannon Gorman. How you doing? Doing good, my friend. I'm doing good. And I can't wait to talk about this. We're going to talk about crayfish and how jig manufacturers are mimicking them during the different stages of their life. So you ready to do that? Yes, sir. Before we get started, this episode is brought to you by Dead Skeeter Company out of Brazelton. And as a matter of fact, our resident fisheries biologist, Shan, is associated with Dead Skeeter. So what separates Dead Skeeter from other, you know, mosquito control companies? And, you know, how does somebody with your background, being in fisheries, how do they get involved with a mosquito company? Seems strange, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely it does. So, Well, mosquitoes come out of water. They have to... They're born in water. They're, mm-hmm. The larvae hatch from eggs, and uh, they ha- they live a part of about a week or ten days of their first part of their life underwater. Uh-huh. Um, so we come at it a little different way. Um, I have a bacteria that I use that I can treat water with. Most mosquito control companies just uh, they just treat your yard with like an insecticide. If the mosquito lands on it, it kills it. Um, we come at it a little different way. We try to treat the, the lakes and the stormwater retention systems, uh, treat the water itself right. to reduce the mosquito population so we don't have to use as much chemicals on people's yards. So is it more safe environmentally going with this bacteria route? Yeah, we, I think so. Right. And I also have on pretty good authority from a friend of mine that uh, works for the state that it looks like some of these, uh, they're called pyrethroids, uh, the mosquitoes are becoming resistant to the pyrethroids. So some of these companies, as the mosquitoes are you know, becoming resistant, uh, are going to be going out of business because they don't have any alternative methods for control. Gotcha. And that's where we're coming in, coming with alternative methods using science. Uh, right. The stuff that I always use was to develop the, the battle of mosquitoes in South America, uh, battle Zika virus. Okay. Um, and they fog, we fog it. Um, onto the water or onto, even onto uh, dry surfaces like leaves. Um, you can have a, a, con, a concave leaf, and mosquitoes instinctively know that the leaf will hold water, and they'll lay their eggs on that leaf. And that, those eggs can remain viable for five years. So if any water gets in that leaf and wets those eggs in the next five years, you can have a mosquito. Seriously? Problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, so by going in and, and putting our, our bacteria down in the woods like that uh, or on the, in the stormwater retention ponds can be another problem um, for people who aren't familiar with stormwater ponds or the ponds that fill up after a rain that catches the runoff from the streets. They stay full for a week or 10 days, and they slowly let the water out. And they're designed to keep the rivers from uh, being washed out by the stormwater right. retention. But the problem is, is there's no fish in ponds like that. And bluegill are excellent control of mosquito larvae. Right. Um, but in ponds with no fish, this is a great alternative. If somebody wanted to get in touch with Dead Skeeter and their services, how would they do it? I think just the website, deadskeetercompany.com. You can check out. We have a price list on there and, and uh, a list of services and things. Uh, it's the best, most informative spot to find us. What's the odds of you actually showing up on a job site if somebody wants to use Dead Skeeter? Oh, 100%. 100%. 100. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. If you have a mosquito control problem, let's get in touch with Shane and them over at Dead Skeeter, and let's get that under control before it gets too late and too far gone into the summer, I guess. That would be yep, time now's the time. Now's Absolutely. The time. All right. So now let's talk crayfish. All right, so lots of stuff to cover, and a lot of anglers want to know uh, as much as they can because they spend a lot of time you know, trying to mimic them while they're fishing. So let's talk about the lifespan of a crayfish starting from conception. Let's, let's start there. Okay. Um, they come out of their burrows at 55 degrees in the early spring, mm-hmm. and that begins their spawning season. Okay, so they spawn like fish. Not really. Not really. They're okay. a little different than fish. Um, when you think about a fish spawn, you know, you, you have a nest and you have a bunch of fish swimming around and, um, they kind of go on their way after a short period of time and try to become adult fish. Right. Crayfish don't work that way. They spawn, but the babies stay on the mother like a spider. There'll be a cluster of eggs on her and they'll be fertilized and those eggs will hatch. Right. And the babies stay on the back end 
and, back and stay on her for a couple of months as they filter the water. They filter zooplankton out of the water and eat it. Gotcha. Is there like a, a mating ritual between a male and a female, or is it just, hey, I, I met you, let's do it? Yeah, there's a little bit of that. Right? Uh, yeah. Okay, um, maybe describe that just so we can kind of understand that. You know, I, I, I didn't study crayfish that in depth. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the rituals of crayfish reproduction. So we don't know. We don't know the love making of a crayfish. Not really. No. Okay. So that's I know their, terrible. I know question. their eggs are fertilized okay. and they hang out on the mother. All right. That's, that's fine. all you need to know. That's, that's fine. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I, maybe I pushed the envelope too far with the crayfish right there. But let's continue on. You know, after a few months, they'll fall off and they'll they'll become juvenile crayfish. They'll f- scrape rocks for algae. Um, okay. Most of our crayfish around here are going to be rock oriented. Mm. Um, you'll get that. Yeah, you know how a rock has a slick surface to it underwater. Right. Um, that's algae. Those are the ones you generally those trout fishermen they know you know a lot about those rocks. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. And the crayfish will scrape that rock for that algae and for the uh, zooplankton that'll stick to it. Um, there'll be all types of zooplankton stuck on there. Okay. And they'll do that. They'll eat that. They also eat each other. They're, okay, that was yeah. That's why yeah. I was getting ready to ask that question because I can remember as a child. My grandfather would take us to a little creek, and it had the crayfish in and all that. And we would catch, and I, I guess he would catch one. And he actually would take the tail and crack it open and take the tail meat and put it on our hook. Mm-hmm. And we would catch the brim and other crayfish, you know, in that creek. So they're not vegetarians. They're, you know. No, they, they can eat anything, okay. um, uh, plant or animal material, and they don't have a problem eating themselves. If they can get, if there's a dead one or an injured one they can eat, they'll definitely eat um, anything. What do you think they use, like, down in Louisiana when they're trapping them? Do they use a meat product or, or, you know, when they put in them traps? I'm just curious. I've seen people use cat food before. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's interesting. I've used cat food before. and canned catch Cat them? food, yeah. And so that works. Yeah. So, all right, guys, if you're out there wanting to trap some crayfish, you know, <laughs> use cat food. So that's interesting. Or a dead fish works well. Is it a scent thing, though? Can they follow scent? Is yeah. that how they do? Yeah. Okay. They can. They, they're just they. They're scavengers, you know. They they scavenge around in the rocks and looking for for whatever they can come across. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. Now, thanks to Castleberry uh, Performance Lure Company, we've got a lot of different colors of jigs right here on this table. And one of the things I assume is they're mimicking crayfish throughout a given year. All right. So let let's basically talk about you know maybe from the first of the year. You know, we our calendar starts in January. Maybe January to December, we can talk about uh, the color scheme of a crayfish because I, I know it changes. It does. It, t- it changes depending on their diet. And I'm, as I look across this table at these jigs, they're beautiful jigs. Um, I like all the colors that I see here. Um, so the one that jumps out at me at 55 degrees on your, on your adult fish, it'll, you'll see this color because they're coming out of clay. So as they, they have to filter the water kind of through that clay, and they'll change the color of clay. So this this just jumps out at me, this color, uh, for an emergent crawfish. That's that's really nice. And when, when is that? When do they emerge? 55 degree 55 water. 55 degrees, mm-hmm. like, like clockwork. Yeah, usually, okay. right, right around then. Right around then, um, all right. That's going to begin their, their spawning cycle, and they're going to be that orange clay color. Okay. Um, and as they... As you know, as the algae begins to grow in the spring, and the and the zooplankton kicks off, and they begin feeding on animal material and plant material, right? Um, it'll change the color of their body. Okay, that's interesting. They'll molt, molt a few times a year, but the molting won't change their colors. Their colors will remain consistent. And it's due to the food. Yeah, it's definitely due to their diet. So it depends on what they're eating, and that depends on the lake that they're in, um, okay. as to you know what's available for them to eat, and that right. kind of dictate their colors, and well, let's 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 go with that. Let's take a lake that's devoid of algae or a lot of that type of stuff. So, what colors would a fisherman want to try to use then? To, I think to put it in in fisherman's terms, I would think of a lake that's probably a stained color. You know, uh, something that stays muddy, like Lake Oconee okay. or Commerce Reservoir stays muddy, and it doesn't allow light penetration, so it doesn't allow much weed growth. So it's pretty devoid of weeds and those stained type bodies of water. Right. And since they don't have much plant material to feed on, they'll be deficient in vitamin A. And vitamin A, since they're deficient in it, will change their colors will be blue to black. Okay, so we're definitely looking at something like this. Exactly. I would I would stay with the blue to blacks in the in the lakes that don't have much weeds because it's gonna match the hatch a little bit better. 
um, generally speaking. Now, will they still come out in that reddish color to start? And this mm-hmm. is something they'll go more to they'll this. They'll kind of transition to a darker blue to black. Um, sometimes it'll also be like a um, like what, what the uh, fish colors call green pumpkin. Okay. Be green pumpkin blue or um, what would you see? Green here pumpkin in this? black. Um, this one here. Okay. Um, if that had a little black, a little more black or blue in it. Right. Um, there's one there. It's green pumpkin blue. Now this is now. Would this stay this color year round until they burrow again, or will they yes. change? Okay. Yeah, so they'll, in, they'll, they'll and they'll it, in a lake devoid of algae. This is pretty much going to be a, something you can use year round. Sure. This or the other two colors that you picked up. Yep. Um, I would start out with my reds or my oranges and then transfer to the blue blacks um, uh, for most of the rest of the summer in your stained lakes. Okay. Then when you go to your clear water lakes. All right, we're changing right here. This is yeah, a different thing. switching up a little bit now. Um, you're probably not going to have blue black crawfish in a clear water lake. Uh, I'm not saying blue black won't work as a, as a lure choice, but. Uh, if it's your match the hatch, you're probably going to go bring green pumpkin uh, to a red tent because they'll have vitamin A. I'm looking at one here. That's okay. beautiful right there. Um, it's a little red to green pumpkin. Right. Um, this guy here. They'll, they'll still start off in the orange. They'll start off in the orange and they'll transition to green pumpkin red. All right, so you got the green pumpkin and all now. Will that be a year-long thing, or will there be several different stages in the clear water? Is it like the it stain will. water? It will. I mean, you got to figure some some fish. I mean, p- there could possibly be a fish kill. They might eat, start eating protein you know, for a long time. If and that would change the color to that, something totally different. That would change the color to something totally different. All right, so, what sure. could, so maybe looking out through here, is there something maybe that's right here that might mimic that if we got a high protein? What I like the, What I like the most about what I see here – are the various colors in each jig. Right. You know, I've got a green pumpkin to blue. I've got a, I've got a tan to red. I've got the orange to red. Uh, the, you, your crawfish are never going to be the exact same color all the way through. Okay. You know, you, like you, you can have green pumpkin with maybe their claws would be tipped in orange. Mm-hmm. That's pretty normal. Um, also your browns, browns to oranges. But having a mixture of colors like that I think is a good idea because it kind of gives you a, a shotgun approach. You know, you don't have to be exactly on it when you've got three different colors like that in the jig. And that's what really jumps out of me about those jigs. They look really good because of the natural colors that I'm seeing and the, and the combinations of the colors that I'm seeing. Okay. Um, now, let me, let's me talk about trailers with these jigs for just a minute because, we're, again, we're, we're mimicking the crawfish. Mm-hmm. Um, several of these have different angled hooks. And I'm assuming that'll be for a different um, approach, you know, that the crawfish is given as it's fleeing or defensive posture. Yeah. So maybe explain how a crawfish, you know, when it senses danger, what are some of the things that in nature that it will do? Yeah, that that is what I noticed. I've never seen any jigs like that. These are these are interesting the way that they lay like this. Certain ones lay down and certain ones are higher up. And, and I would say that the ones that are laying more flat are kind of representing a, a crawfish that's trying to hide. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the ones that would be upward more are more of a defensive posture, like that they, they'll take, they'll, they try to, you know, bow up if you will. Right. Um, and I could see like, a, a good, a good crayfish pattern on that would, would stand up and, and really, really be noticeable. Um, and that defensive posture, I, I like the way that looks a lot. When a, when a crawfish is full grown, uh, especially here in North Georgia, how big are we talking? Oh, man, I've seen them six inches long. Seriously? Yeah, big ones, like lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I bet that wouldn't be the norm? or No, no. What, no. What's the norm? Um, I'd say probably about three inches. About three for inches. For an adult one. Okay. And uh, want to go back, I didn't touch on something. Um, your juvenile crawfish, probably like your first year crawfish, if they were born this year and they happen to make it to next year. Right. Those don't tend to burrow. Um, the Only the adults will burrow down to get away from the bass. Um, the small ones will find rocks and things to hide under through the winter and they won't burrow down. So since they're not in the ground, you're going to smaller crawfish. And and I'm looking at these patterns here, you know, we've got, we've got some smaller profiles here. Right. Um, the smaller crawfish will hold that green pumpkin or that black color all winter. So you'll really will have a very diverse color selection of crawfish. Um, you know, they're not all going to come out red and they're not all going to start, you know, they're not 
all starting at red. Um, some will start at green, some will start at blue, and then their colors will, will transition. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that because on a lot of the uh, Facebook pages that we follow and that we're looking at on a daily basis, you know, you'll have guys catching them on, of course, the orangish and the red colors that you're talking about. And then on the very same day, a guy's using the green pumpkin. Absolutely. So probably what you're saying, and, and I, you're speculating, is, is a guess, sure. that if one is catching a bunch in one area on the orange, there's a lot of adults that are coming out at that point. And if they're catching a lot on the green pumpkin, it could be a big juvenile section of crayfish in that area. You nailed it. So that's kind of a way, you know, a biologist would think that might, can, that information can kind of tell you. If that's the case, mm -hmm. if that's the case and you're an angler, I would suspect, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that if we're getting a lot caught on the orange, blackish, we can go with a little bit bigger jig. But if we're going green pumpkin, smaller like that, maybe downsize the jig a little bit like that? I think that's a great idea. Okay, well, that's just, just from something you said, and that's not something that I've done, but it just makes sense with the information that you just gave us. I haven't either, but I'm going to start doing that. That makes sense. <laughs> so if you're out there listening, there's your fish North Georgia tip of the day. We just, you know, we were thinking about that. And I'm sure somebody out there, they do that. You know, they know. I'm sure the great anglers know that information already. So um, one last question. Uh, I noticed we've got a lot of different on the blade baits here. You know, they're they're a little bit different, but a lot of people slow roll them on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not mimicking crawfish with a blade, a blade bait, or have you seen that? Well, I kind of do mimic crawfish with a blade bait. Um, I will, I'll stall it. You know, I'll, I'll maybe, maybe three, four turns and pause and let it fall to the bottom. And then do it again and let it fall to the bottom. And it kind of mimics the way a, a crayfish will will shoot. You ever seen one right. run away? Right. So um, real quick off the bottom, like burst the reel and then stall it. And get and they'll, they'll hit it on the fall. Okay. But you'll, you'll still use more of the colors that we're talking about, like the red and blacks, yep. even with the blade bait. Yep, absolutely. So, they, so these brighter ones, we're, we're talking more like a, a you know, a, a shad or something representation if, yeah, if they're using that. I, yeah. Uh, I really like the idea of, um, like we talked about in the prior podcast, the frequency that the that the chatter bait, the blade bait gives off. Um, so I would definitely like that in like a stain situation. Okay. It gives me gives me the lateral line that gives the fish something to feel, as well as something to see. Okay. Um, but, but still the, fishing the, it like a jig, sort of. Very much like a jig. Um, I also like um, some of your crawfish. Um, patterns are, are will float and i've actually caught fish so you can cast let it sink and maybe fish it like a worm you know drag it for a minute well even though it's a blade bait really yeah just just i picked up fish that way before where you're just you fish it for maybe three feet because you know when you for me anyway when i'm fishing with plastic worms i don't fish it really back to the boat i'll make a cast around the structure i'll move the worm around the structure and then i'll bring it back right put it in there again um, it seems like to me, I get that bite on a worm on that first fall right, and right, first right. little mid of movement, you right. know, um, and I'll fish a, a blade bait that way, or I'll drag it like a worm a little, a little bit and then pick it up and start reeling it, stalling it, reeling it, stalling it, and giving it that, that crayfish kind of a fleeing crayfish look to it. Uh -huh. Catch a lot of fish that way. Okay, that's interesting. And, you know, basically I think our, our information, we, we're kind of thinking about lakes like Lanier, the bigger lakes, but somebody said a farm pond, you know, just a one-acre to five-acre lake. Same rules apply as far as color scheme? So. You think so yeah, like that? I really do. Mm -hmm. and, and how prevalent are crayfish in Georgia waters, especially North Georgia? Oh, they're everywhere. Okay, so mm -hmm. even the big the big lakes got them, rivers, everything. Everybody's got them. Yep. Everybody's got them. So, yep. okay. All right, well, guys, you know, that makes a lot of sense with uh, the color selection that we've talked about and, and using these. Uh, you can use a jig year-round now, given that you know the colors and stuff like that. So um, we've learned a little bit about crayfish, and I hope you'll take that knowledge and put it to use. And, man, I appreciate you helping us with that. Mm, thank you. All right, man, thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Fish North Georgia podcast. Guys, if you're interested in any of the jigs you saw in this episode, you can go to our very own online store at fishnorthgeorgia.com and you can browse Castleberry's entire selection there. So go check it out. We want to thank Shan for doing this episode. He has a page on Facebook called The Aquatic Biologist. You need to go give him a follow there. A lot of cool pictures, a lot of great information, as always, from Shan. You can get it there. 
at The Aquatic Biologist. And as always, guys, if you like our content and our videos and podcasts on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscribe button. You also can follow us on Facebook at Fish North Georgia and the Fish North Georgia group. So go to both of those and you can get in on all the conversations. You can follow us on Instagram at Fish North Georgia and Twitter at Fish North GA. Okay, it's a little bit different. Fish North Georgia, but it's GA. So go check all of them out and we hope to see you soon.